Hello and welcome to the Cuyamonga Institute, our Q&A conversation for our exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach. And on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, our volunteers and supporting members, we do want to thank you for joining us today. The Cuyamonga Institute is an independent nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring um, a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. And that's part of our mission, to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary um, understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we do invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. And that's why we call this conversation for exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics from neuroscience and anthropology and archaeology, archaeoastronomy, eco-spirituality, philosophy, psychology, mythology, shamanism, uh, rituals, the hero's journey, the roots of theater. It goes on and on and on from the arts to the sciences and everything in between. There's so much more. We actually have a couple hundred of these presentations available for you as webcasts. Also, uh, YouTube and podcasts, so you, you can visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. And all of these presentations are free. And as a nonprofit, of course, we want to invite you to become a supporting member to join our inner circle. And we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Queermonga Institute. <clears throat> Not too long ago, it seemed that no matter how many reports of the UFO phenomena was gathered, it kept getting pushed to the side. It was kind of considered a fringe topic. Not anymore. Scientists and government officials are no longer afraid to talk about and study the, the sightings of objects in the sky, but maybe they just don't want to call them UFOs. <laughs> Let's invent a new term. Yeah. yeah, unidentified aerial phenomena, UAPs, which is the name the government now uses instead of UFOs. It's kind of reached the mainstream media in a big way. And earlier this summer, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence released a nine-page report titled Preliminary Assessment, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. And it was in 2022 that NASA created an independent study team to begin the process of exploring the UAPs from the scientific perspective. And they released a report that lays the path for the research committee to continue to gather all of the data about this unknown and strange things that happen above us on Earth. And so far from the end of the UFO controversy, this is just the beginning of a new chapter. Well, keyword, gather all the data, right? To study a phenomenon, gather far and wide. And I think that our guest today has done what, what amateur astronomers are doing. The more eyeballs you have watching the sky, they discover comets, they... Uh, the more data you're going to gather. Mm -hmm. So similarly to this UFO phenomenon, our guest has created the UFO hotline. It's been going on for three decades. Yeah. So this is about citizens and uh, professionals alike calling in their sightings. Eyewitness reports, let's collect the data. Um, what a service, what a longstanding service over all these 30 years that he's been doing this. Let's introduce Peter Davenport. He's the director of the National UFO Reporting uh, Hotline. Hello, Peter, and welcome. I have to say that you sent me your bio, and I have to ask, because you have an impressive bio. Given your undergrad education at Stanford, where you earned bachelor's degrees in both Russian and biology, Given your University of Washington MS degree in genetics and biochemistry of fish from the College of Fisheries, and an MBA in finance and international business. I mean, they they want to say, oh, any UFO research is going to be the coup. No, I'm sorry, not Peter. Given your wide range of occupations, 
college instructor, commercial fisherman, Russian translator, working in the Soviet Union, yeah. flight instructor for gliders. <laughs> <clears throat> and then you turn to high tech and business. You found a Seattle-based biotech company, which grows to employ 300 scientists and technicians. Not to mention having your eye on a seat with the Washington State Legislature and later the U.S. House of Representatives. Okay, given all that, I'm exhausted just contemplating all that, Peter. What is it about the UFO phenomenon that drew you away from what could have been very promising careers in any of these uh, arenas? Other fields, yeah. Yeah. I know you had a sighting early on in your life, but to make a career of the investigation of a phenomenon that was so widely ridiculed for so many decades. And given what our government is admitting to now, which if true, makes this indeed one of the most paradigm shifting and life as we knew it altering moments in history, though I suspect it's been with us for millennia, not just decades. Peter, did you always suspect it would come to this worthy of your considerable time and attention? No, the course my life has taken is a total surprise to me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I got here, but let me start by saying thank you very much for having me on. I'm delighted to be talking about my favorite subject, UFOs, and how nice it is to be back working with Laura Lee and Paul Robert. It, it makes me nostalgic <laughs> because you are the first hostess that I ever worked with on radio, Laura Lee. And uh, that went on to working with uh, many other hosts. Uh, so this is a trip down nostalgia lane. Lane, I'm just delighted to be back with you. Well, I but will say, Peter, that once you have a UFO sighting, which I did, um, you you know you have to start investigating it. So my my mission was, hey, let's get somebody on who can tell us more about this, right? Right. So, um, but I want to say I always know you to be an eccentric, impressive career history as you have. You own a decommissioned military missile base, not an everyday acquisition, Peter. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I don't but, know why I purchased that, but I have an affinity for things that are solid and strong and are going to be around for a while. And a missile yeah. site seemed like it would fill the bill. But I was <laughs> looking for a facility where I could get all of my books on one wall. <laughs> Not to mention walls impressive. In it. Go ahead. There are two walls in it that are 90 feet long and 16, no, 20 feet tall. And I figured I could get most of my books on that wall, but I hadn't allowed for the dampness and the dirt. So, yeah. Oh, because I was going to say that might be a good place for your archives because three decades worth of taking over half a million phone calls on your UFO reporting hotline, you yeah. must have an impressive database, something that really is valuable to understand this phenomenon. Right. Yeah. I think we just updated our website a couple of days ago, and I think we have 158,000, in excess of 158,000 reports in our database. Most of those are posted to our website. Mm. So there's a lot of material there, and yeah. it's coming in faster than ever before. So it's growing faster than I ever imagined would be the case. But I'd like to go, go ahead. Do you attribute that to more? objects flying around in the skies or encounters, or do you attribute that to people just being more aware of the hotline? Good question. And I think it's ascribable to a number of things, but most of all, it's become much less frowned upon to report a UFO sighted. Yeah. A lot of people are much more accepting of it now that the government is talking about it. And we'll right. talk about that government later on in this program, but I think people are just more comfortable with the subject and they're willing to pick up the telephone and call the hotline. Gotcha. Yeah. So, and we'll give out that phone number. And also you request written reports are much more valuable to you. A written yes. report and drawings, if you can. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And let's go back to the beginning, if we could, because Laura had asked a really good question in the beginning. And that was, what was it for you, the inspiration no. for you to choose this as a career, as more than a career? This is this is a life passion. passion. 
I think the reason I'm on a Zoom program with Laura Lee and Paul Robert talking about UFOs can be ascribed to one incident in my youth. I think I was six and a half years of age. It was July or August of 1954. I was seated in the right-hand seat of our family car, which was a 1953 Studebaker. And we had one of the most dramatic UFO sightings I've ever heard of. Oh, it wow. was, we were on the southern edge of the St. Louis airport. The reason we were out there was my father had to work one evening. He was the station manager for a major American airline in St. Louis. And he had to do some work in his office. So my whole family, my two parents and my older brother and I drove to the airport, dropped my father off so he could do his work and the three of us, my mother, brother, and I drove around to the south side of the airport. We were watching a drive-in theater at the Airway Cinema in St. Louis when all of a sudden panic broke out in the theater. People were running and pointing up in the air, and they were being illuminated by a strange red light. Wow. And I could tell they were looking to our right. I looked out the right-hand side of the car and saw one of the most dramatic things I've ever seen in my 75 years. It was a disc-shaped object, bright red. It was so bright it was hard to look at. I didn't want to look at it. And it was moving just very, very slowly. Suddenly, after a few seconds, it accelerated. It shot almost straight up in the sky and went behind the screen and disappeared over the northwestern high horizon. That whole incident took place in about five seconds or less. Mm -hmm. And that explains why I'm on a Zoom program with Laura Lee and Paul Robert in October of uh, 2023. Yeah. Oh, my. Life changing. Was, yeah. What if your dad hadn't I, gone out that night and took the kids? Yeah. Yeah, we would have missed it. Yeah. And, Interestingly, I'm the only one who's reported that incident in our database. Uh, there must be at least some people who were there that night who've never reported it. And that supports a point that I will probably make during the program, and that is we're capturing only very, very few of UFO sightings. I estimate out of 10,000 to 20,000 UFO sightings, experienced by Americans or other people on this planet, we managed to get only one one of those sightings recorded in written form and on a website somewhere, one out of 20,000. So when you imagine that and how many sightings must be taking place, I remember talking to Ingo Swan, and he was saying that in his opinion, when people see something just so out of the realm of their worldview that sometimes you just can't process it sometimes your your mind just blanks it out do you find do you suspect that's also happening yeah quite often actually i get talk to people on the phone quite frequently probably between 10 and 50 calls a day come in uh, over the hotline and that's one of the themes i frequently hear people say i don't know why i've waited 30 years to tell the story but this is what I saw. Hmm. And I think you're right. I think Ingo Swan was right. It just, the human mind blocks out stuff that it can't handle. Hmm. Yeah. For, no does, for which it does not have a convenient niche, let's say. Hmm. Um, does it surprise you that the government now is admitting, oh, there are things out there that we can't explain? We've even read reports where they're saying, oh, we've actually have uh, retrieved a UFO hardware. We've, we've retrieved an alien. These kinds of reports. How do you process hardware. those? Yeah. Hardware, yeah. Yeah, it is a little surprising. And I don't want to congratulate myself, but their position may be the result of a paper I wrote on the use of passive radar for detecting UFOs. And I even proposed using a U.S. Navy facility uh, either with or without their permission, 
to detect UFOs in the Earth's atmosphere. And it was shortly after that that the Navy announced that they were going to shut down the U.S. Naval Space Surveillance System, which is what they use for tracking satellites entering American airspace. Mm. So who knows why the government has become more liberal in, with this information, but I'm pleased to see it because the UFO phenomenon is or addresses the most important subject that's ever confronted mankind. Namely, are we alone in this universe or are we not? Mm -hmm. And from my vantage point, clearly we are not alone. We're being visited, in my opinion, daily by these yeah. things we call, I prefer the term UFO. I don't yeah. want the government to take that away from me. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Peter, then that comes back to categorization of experiences. There's that what you refer to as extraterrestrial types of experiences, but it's also just the phenomena itself, unidentified phenomena that's happening around us. And so there's such a spectrum of it. And of course, the the uh, government's really focused on the phenomena. Not They're not talking in terms of extraterrestrial activity. They're just talking about the fact that there's something in the sky that's unidentified. Is that correct? As far as I know, and I have not followed the government's revelation on this yeah. at all. Uh, I just, I don't trust them. They've been, I probably used the term line in a few occasions in the past, but I think it's much more correct to say they've been shielding the American people from information that would change their perception of their reality dramatically mm -hmm. and they've been doing it so long that i no longer trust any new information they bring forth to us yeah i, I think they're controlling the data intentionally that uh, brings up controlling the data i'm sorry laura i wanted to ask the question do you feel that they'd like to put you out of business and not have a a publicly uh uh, open I think they're forum. competing now. Are they competing with you at this point, do you think? I've wondered about that, but I have no evidence. Strangely, yeah. the Arrow organization, which has announced recently they're setting up their own hotline, maybe they have already by now, uh, they didn't approach me at all. And I have 29 years experience in this this field. By the way, this month is our birthday. 49 oh. years the UFO Center has been here. Oh, wow. wow. Fabulous. Congrats. Yeah. I've, I've done it for 29, and my oh. predecessor, Bob yeah. Gribble, did 20 before I took it over. Yeah. Oh, good heavens. Yeah. So there's, what, wow, 50 years worth of records? Um, yeah. So how are you set up? You have a phone? People call? Yeah. If, if two calls come in once, somebody goes to voicemail, you, you're you listening to a lot of calls. That oh, yeah. does take up a lot of time. What do you do with a call? Do you screen it and go, this is worthy of actually making a report or not? Or um, yeah. how, well, what's your I, procedure? I tape record the calls. You're right. The phone can ring at any time of day or night. I usually turn the ringer off when I go to bed. So I'm not disturbed by it. But yes, yeah, sleep uh, is important. Yeah. I take calls around the clock. Whenever I'm up and within earshot of the telephone is fair game. And they call. I try to get get them off the line as quickly as possible. Most people who call the hotline assume that the important part of their report is their oral account of it over the telephone. I disagree. Uh, as you pointed out earlier in the program, Laura, the important part of the report is the written document, which serves to preserve the data and allows us to share it with a large number of people. We can't share a telephone conversation very easily. Mm -hmm. And I've decided that talking is probably one of the most inefficient means of communication mankind has invented. <laughs> and here I am on a talk show talking about talking. Yeah. But uh, during that initial conversation with the witness, I try to convince them to write down everything about their sighting that somebody reading their report would like to know. 
and submit it using our online report form at ufocenter.com. Mm -hmm. That's that's the bulk of what I do is trying to get them to write down the facts of the the sighting and also share photos if they got photos. Mm -hmm. I will say it's handy to have open access to a database because with my own sighting, I was immediately on the phone to Peter, what do you think? What, what, how do I understand this? What, how right. do I compare it to other sightings? Right. And uh, you insisted I write it down. So I did. And then you put us through prompts. Anybody wanting to upload their report, you're putting us through prompts, which is questions. Did you yeah. consider this? What about this? What about this detail? And so it really asks you to examine this to pull out that useful data yeah. for comparisons mm -hmm. and uh, documentation. Usually during that first conversation with a witness, I, you're correct, I cite a number of things that we'd like to know. For example, where were you? What were the time and date? What direction were you looking? Angle of elevation. How large was the object? And this is a stumbling block. How large was the object? Most people say it was humongous, which doesn't mean anything to anyone. We try to get them to compare the apparent size of the object to the apparent size of a full moon, for example, or a star or a planet and give them hints as to what we would like to have them include in their report. All of that information is crucially important for being able to uh, have a handle on what it was they saw. Hmm. For example, currently in the early evening, Jupiter is in the eastern sky. It's a major planet, of course. Right. And we're getting lots of calls about it. So... With if oh. they were looking to the west, it's not Jupiter. If they're looking to the east, it's probably Jupiter. And, For, and really, to take advantage of all the work that you're doing and in, in creating a database of it, there's going to be a lot of of filler that doesn't necessarily need to get the full attention as some of the others. I'm sure okay. that there's some key key avenues that you recognize as like this is where we need to go, and this is sort of a distraction over here. How how do you discern that and have that as your guiding guiding post? Good question. And with the, the amount of experience I have on a UFO hotline, it's not too difficult to determine initially or pretty quickly whether a call is a serious report of a UFO or whether it might be a hoax or uh, case of mistaken identity. Mm -hmm. example, we're getting a lot of reports about the Starlink satellites currently. Oh, yeah, yeah I've seen those. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you let a person crazy. talk for a few seconds and ask them a few pointed questions as to what the cluster looked like, you can establish early on in the conversation whether it might have been the, an overflight of Starlink satellites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, speaking, you to have an astronomer. Well, speaking of that, Tony has his hand up, and Tony is an astrophysicist and astronomer, and he's the one that was talking to us about what the problem of the satellites around the planet in the next decade that it will be difficult even to see. There'll be more satellites the stars. than to see the stars. Anyway, yeah. Tony, can you jump in on the conversation? Give your hand up. Yeah. There you are. Yeah, I'll be happy to. No, no this, uh, let's see, unmute. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I've often wondered uh, if part of the cause of, of why this has been suppressed the way it is has been something to do with the response to Wells' War of the Worlds, mm. which was put out a realistic news uh, broadcast about the extraterrestrials right. coming. And people were jumping from buildings and committing suicide, and, and there was actually chaos that resulted from that. So I, I'm wondering... Like a dry if, run, yeah. I'm wondering if this um might this might have been taken as an example or a line of thinking by the government that if we take this seriously and we don't have the means to detect or manage the situation that there could be mass terror mass panic uh, disruptions of different kinds on that almost to the point where uh, i wonder if there are plants with such obviously uh, spurious reports uh, mm. you know, you at cloud cloud formations that are obviously cloud formations uh, reported uh, as flying saucers. You look at at very, very blurred pictures, pixelated, very blurred uh, pictures that are hardly distinguishable as 
as evidence. And the response people have, oh, oh, those poor pathetic people, they, uh, they're, they're, they're uh, picking on things that that where there's no reality. They're they're trying to pull a signal out of the noise where they can't. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if this has almost been a matter of policy to uh, to suppress and render ridiculous, so there will not be concern that the government can't deal with it. Mm -hmm. Peter? Could be. Uh, you're right, Tony. I agree that there's a lot of noise in the signal. I don't know what percentage of the reports we have posted to our website are cases of mistaken identity or even out-and-out -out hoaxes. A lot of people, for some reason, right. like to hoax us. But it's somewhere between 1% and 99%. That's as close as I can get. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> Astrophysical precision, yes, I love it. But yeah. For example, on the 3rd of October, I received a telephone call from the UK from an uh, airline pilot with 39 years experience. And he reported that he was flying from London to Peking. And they might have been over outer Mongolia. At night, they saw a cluster of objects above their airplane. They were at 39,000 feet. And he saw a cluster of objects moving very abruptly and moving relative to one another. That's That type of report is very difficult to... Oh, that it, dismiss. It, yes. it was a legitimate report. And I called the gentleman back. We had a nice conversation. And I was convinced that he had seen something very unusual. Mm -hmm. After all, he's had 39 years in the cockpit as an airline pilot. He'd be someone who'd be very difficult to deceive with a sighting. Uh, could I tell a little story? Because this is right online with that. Uh, as a graduate student in the 70s, I was at Kitt Peak National Observatory at the telescope. And, and as a good astronomer will, every half an hour or so, you peek out to see if clouds are coming up or things that would interfere with your observations. On the eastern horizon, I saw a constellation of, of seven objects, and they were moving laterally down. Then they would go over, and then they'd come up again. And then they would keep on moving in this very slow, in-formation manner. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, I figured if they were coming my way, I was the first telescope. I would soon be uh, get to know to know what's happening there. Uh, and then a few years ago, I was reading a um, narrative by the author Lucy Bledsoe, uh, the San Francisco novelist, and she was describing an experience she and a friend had in the desert, where she experienced the. Uh, this was in um, uh, Eastern California, where something very very similar happened. And she described it as the most terrifying, uh, evocative thing she'd ever seen. And she'd faced uh, mountain lions and and slept in, in Antarctica and done all sorts of things, in ice caves in Antarctica, done all sorts of things. But she said this was totally terrifying. Mm -hmm. And she, she started running away from it, um, uh, I guess, bare naked, barefoot. And her, her companion tackled her, saying, they're going to follow us if you run. Um, so uh, uh, there's a there's a narrative in, in in the book of almost the same thing that I saw, and you mentioned the airline pilot seeing a constellation of lights. Um, uh, when I talked to the people at the observatory about it, they said, "Oh, that's just a bombing range," but I don't see how a parachute flares could fall anything like the description of what I saw. Yeah, I agree. So, so so thank you and i have to ask you what is passive radar i know a lot about detection optical detection but I... I think well i'd love to talk about it i think it constitutes the most consequential academic contribution i've made to the world at the, to this point in my life it is a system that capitalizes on detecting reflected commercial radio and television signals being gotcha. reflected by objects in the atmosphere. So that, you that, don't need that, a makes bit, that makes every bit of sense. I understand already. Yeah. It's yeah. you're looking for perturbations. Yeah. 
Interestingly, I was invited to a MUFON Mutual UFO Network Symposium in December of 93, I was invited. And I decided to do something other than just recount eyewitness accounts. Right. Uh, that Going to a MUFON Symposium and talking about UFO sightings is like taking a cup of salt water to Honolulu. It, you just don't need to do it. <laughs> But I wrote a paper on the subject entitled Using Passive Radar to Detect UFOs. On his website. It was published on the 6th of July, 1994. That afternoon, I got a telephone call from a senior officer at the CIA. He said, Mr. Davenport, you don't know me, but I know you from your, thanks to you, Laura, uh, from your radio work. He said, a retired colleague of mine just sent the abstract from your paper to my desk, and I'm calling to congratulate you, because if you build the system that you outline in your paper, you will be successful in answering the question of whether UFOs are real. He did not say you will detect UFOs, I noted. He said you will be successful in determining whether UFOs are real or not. Mm -hmm. Isn't that implied that he's already done that? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, no, it implies that that there is a method that's similar to what uh, what Peter described. Yes. That would be capable, that would be capable of doing it. But and he pointed out to me yeah. that he's a PhD in electrical engineering. His first mm -hmm. twenty years in the CIA were dedicated. He told me to building passive radar systems for clandestine detection of targets. And I think I hit the nail on the head. And such a system has been built by Mitch Randall in Colorado, who is seeking funding. And I think in the very near future, within a year or two, we will have a system that will allow us to detect UFOs without the aid of unreliable eyewitnesses and without fuzzy photographs. Mm. Mm. And, and coming back to the satellite issue, which you brought up, and I mentioned that Tony had spoken to us about previously, and that is, is that as the sky continues to, to, to fill more and more and more satellites, the number of satellites that are being launched in the next decade is, is unbelievable to uh, yeah. imagine. It's going to distort all this information. It's going to be very difficult to follow the, the phenomena uh, without yeah. having some kind of technology like you're talking about. Yeah, it's going to be difficult to see the stars for heaven's sakes. Yeah. Okay, so but a question, though, and Tony, you said you understood immediately what Peter is referring to. Give us lay people a little bit of a of a sense, because how do we know what the technology is that's propelling these UFOs? How do we know what kind of mark they're going to register in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum that's being that's being captured by this array that you're describing mm -hmm. how do we know i mean how many different species civilizations whatever do we have here um well, is it a single phenomenon or many phenomenon um well, well, how, well, how me, is this working say, uh, peter peter can answer the question uh much better than i can except i will say that that if this has a physical body if it has any electromagnetic characteristics any reflective characteristics uh, anything that could distort um, uh, both light and, and radio rays and, and create Doppler and other signals, uh, this may be detectable. And I can only imagine that the, the various modalities that, that um, both Mitch and, and, and Peter could be using here, but, but I think there clearly are ways to, to do this. This is uh, basically working on, on perturbations caused on... on you're looking at a field and it's constant and all of a sudden something is changing and if you have multiple locations you may be able to determine where the perturbation is and then pretty soon you can see how the perturbation is moving this is my extrapolation and uh peter you can answer this better than i can i apologize for for talking to this oh, oh thank you for your contribution well, to me. yeah i think uh it may be one of the reasons the government has become more liberal in releasing information, because in my paper, as I pointed out earlier in the program, I propose 
that we use the Navy surveillance system, which after all is a passive radar system. They generate a whopping strong signal into the atmosphere. And whenever a satellite passes through that electromagnetic radiation, it reflects it back down to pl the planet Earth. Makes sense. And so UFO would just be behaving erratically and not in the same flight plans as planes or satellites or known exactly. objects. Is that if you the measure, key? Yeah, if you and, measure their location 10 or 20 times a second, you have time and distance that gives you velocity and you can they determine travel much faster. object is not exhibiting traditional terrestrial flight characteristics. So I'm very excited about it. And I was yeah. contacted a year ago by Mitch Randall, who's building, has built a prototype right. and it seems to work fine. Hmm. So I'm very excited about it. Yeah. yeah. Is, uh, is there a question of, of putting a powerful signal up or he's using the ambient signal in some way? You just use the signals that are being generated by commercial radio and television stations. And well, that propagates that. out in all directions. Mm -hmm. And you build a receiver that is shielded from the original transmitter. So the only signal you're getting is a reflected signal from the target of interest. But I'm very excited about it. It essentially will end the debate over UFOs. Mm -hmm. what, what, what frequency or wavelength is he operating at, Peter? Can operate at any frequency. All you're doing is listening for the detected reflected or the oh, no. signal. I mean, for example, weather is detected by radar. So if you're in the RF, there'll be natural signals. Uh, yeah. The same thing with the atmosphere, you'll get reflection off clouds and, and, and even flights of birds. But uh, as you say, if you can process this for, for, uh, for time and position equals velocity equals acceleration and stuff, you can identify an anomaly. And I, I think that's fascinating. Mm. Yes. And if that yeah. anomaly exhibits non-terrestrial characteristics, for example, traveling at 20,000 kilometers a minute, yeah, not be United Flight 263 going to Buffalo, <laughs> would, not be a, would not be a flock of Canadian geese or a, a plastic bag being buffeted in the atmosphere. Right. Gotcha. Or a Chinese balloon. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's, yeah, one of yeah. Things, one of go ahead, Tony. Yeah. Strike me what I saw was there was both smooth motion, then there was discontinuous motion, which would imply very high accelerations. Yes. And so I'm I'm that made me very curious. Well, I should I should stop and let Peter talk, but this is this is very interesting. Well and I appreciate you my question and, and listening to my my experience. And yes, if you like, I would write this up, even though even though it's decades old, I remember it quite vividly. Yeah. As That's one characteristic do. of good sightings. People report to me, I don't know how many thousands of times I've heard this, but they remember sightings that they had yeah. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago. Whatever, yeah. And they remember it like it ha had happened last night. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. certainly the case with me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this yeah. this was I, one of my most I, memorable nights at a, at a professional telescope. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the two of you will have to have a conversation for sure. Uh, that'd be great. Nice to get the Tony yeah. seal of approval. Yeah, there, we, we uh, yeah. yeah. Well, well, again, thank you, Peter. Let me uh, yeah. let me get off, but I, I've enjoyed yeah. this. Nice yeah. to meet you, thank Tony. You. Yeah. And of course, anyone else who wants to uh, share a question or a comment, um, uh, just a, a raise sighting. your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can add that. I well. just want to ask about the range of sightings. What are right. some of the most unusual or anomalous within? The most convincing was the question the... I had. What's okay. the most convincing? Did you hear over and over? Oh, like, that up. cannot be dismissed. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I find that's an easy question. It's a question I feel quite frequently on programs. What's the yeah. most dramatic sighting you've had? Yeah. And I can answer it with, unambiguously. It's the Phoenix Lights event. Yes. Um, yes. Thursday night, March thirteenth, nineteen ninety-seven. Right. Yeah. I remember. The objects that hovered over Phoenix that night. We have the information that allows us to calculate their size. We know what their altitude was. We know how much of the sky they blotted out as they went overhead. Wow. 
we calculate that the objects that loitered over Phoenix for two hours that night were at least eight miles from wingtip to wingtip. They were eight miles wide. Oh, and that's hard to even imagine. Yeah. Eight miles wide. Yeah. Because you saw no stars between the array of lights, and so it was a physical object blocking the stars. Exactly. From you for it. For... It blotted out the stars as it passed over them. But there were either five or six, possibly six objects in a very large disk we estimate to have been two miles in diameter. But the for those people who might be listening or watching this program who have a propensity to do trigonometry, I invite them to do the calculation themselves. We, we have had reported by multiple people that the object that passed over Camelback Mountain that night subtended an arc of about 135 degrees, over a third of a circle. It mm. was huge. And at that time, we know from a U.S. Air Force lieutenant colonel who intercepted it, that it was 9,000 feet above ground level at that point. And if you do the trigonometry, that translates to an object that was eight and a quarter miles from wingtip to wingtip. The pilot himself reported to his ground crew when he returned to his base at Luke Air Force Base, that as he sat in his cockpit approaching this object, he looked out his left canopy window and he could see the left-hand wingtip of it. He looked out the right side of his canopy and he could see it, the right wingtip of it. It filled 180 degrees of his windscreen. Hmm. It was a huge object. And that, by the way, was the night that Bill Clinton, President Bill Clinton, was spending the night at the Australian golfer's home, Greg Norman. Mm -hmm. President Clinton had been invited down to Florida to go golfing on that day. That was the night that he allegedly injured his knee that he had to be spirited back to Washington, D.C. I should send President Clinton a note asking him whether that in fact was a real incident or whether it was perhaps a ruse, a deception in response to the very dramatic events that were taking place over Phoenix that night. And mm -hmm. they went on for two hours. So somebody had the, no doubt had the presence of mind to pick up a telephone and let the president of the United States know what was going on over Phoenix. And that would have evoked a panic, I suspect. So the lights just stayed there. That object just I stayed there for two hours. And then the military had planes flying around. Any Then it just went away? I mean, what else happened? Well, it's a complex situation. It didn't sit there for two hours. It was uh, motionless in the sky above people's heads on Camelback Mountain for about five minutes, they estimated. And then it shot south down to Sky Harbor Airport and hovered over the airport for a while. In fact, one pilot who was just about to push back from the gate delayed his departure because he didn't like the looks of that thing hovering above his airplane. Yeah, I don't blame him. <laughs> yeah. And there was a Hollywood actor who was flying into Sky Harbor that night who saw it. I've forgotten his name. But he he and his son were approaching Sky Harbor Airport, and they saw this thing hovering in the sky, and he reported it over the radio. So we know it was there. And... But this would speak to the um, technology of whatever it was, that you could actually float something eight miles. Well, I mean, that's huge. Yes. How, how do you, you know, What's like, a different propulsion how do you that we don't hang that yeah. much hardware together? Right. Right. What What is the tensile strength of whatever it is you're using? How do you bend metal or whatever substances exactly. to that dimensions? I mean, some interesting questions it would pose. So and one of the reports what... we saw was that somehow some contractors have gotten hold of whatever ships are recovered and they're back reverse engineering it. They're trying right. to discover it's, what is the propulsion method? What is this made of? This is just um, in the recent news in the last 30 days. That this, so yeah. it's interesting that from so 1997 to now, right? You, um, yeah. 
So what is the range? Uh, what is some of the other outliers of reports? And I mean, this phenomenon is vast and varied. What yeah. are some of the other? He wants to know the most. Well, no, Mark, Mark asked the question, what's your opinion about the Zimbabwe incident in 1994? I'm not familiar with the Zimbabwe. I can share a little. Yeah, the school the schoolyard sighting by a bunch of uh, young students uh, there's a term for it the i can't think of the term that's usually applied to that sighting it occurred on friday the 16th of september 1994 mm -hmm. and i know that because there was a similar incident in california one week earlier that i reported few people picked up on it in fact it was shortly after i'd taken over the hotline in august of 1994 Right. that this incident occurred in California and a week later in Zimbabwe. And I got so excited that I called Stan Friedman up in Canada to share with him the facts of it. A well-known UFO, UFO researcher, yeah. Yeah. But uh, a young girl was standing at a bus stop early in the morning, about 6 or 6.30 in the morning, I seem to recall. And... She reported to the school nurse when she finally got to school that she had been approached by a little gray man while she stood at her bus stop who asked her if she wanted to take a ride. And oh. it was a dramatic, dramatic sighting. Hmm. She so, didn't accept the offer, I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> but I've had a lot of really, truly shocking reports come to me not only over the hotline but many of those people have followed up with written reports one of the earlier ones was from uh, massachusetts or rhode island a young pilot was flying from nantucket to southeastern new hampshire and he looked out ahead of his airplane he was at 7500 feet above the water and near Providence, Rhode Island. And he saw a large object that at first he thought was a soaring bird, an eagle or a vulture or something along those lines. And he glanced down in his cockpit for just a second to check something and glanced back to make sure he was going to clear this object and not collide with it. Mm -hmm. Then he realized that it was streaking towards his aircraft. It passed his aircraft within 50 vertical feet of his starboard wing. Hmm. And uh, it shocked him. He got on the radio immediately and called Air Route Traffic Control Center and asked them if they had anything in proximity to his aircraft. Initially, and I have the tape on this, they said, no, there's nothing near you. A few seconds later, they chimed in again and said, we have it now. It has reversed its course. And it is in train with your airplane. It's just behind you. Uh -huh. That was a good sighting. That was a good sighting. Is there some sort of etiquette, you know, with with the UFO phenomenon and and humanity? I mean, you would think that there's no, there's not been like landing on the White House lawn yet, right? Other but there's, movies. yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I have to tell you a quick story. So we were doing open phones on radio and just you know, what's, what's the most unusual experience that you've had happen? And somebody calls in and they say, well, we were playing golf. Oh, <laughs> Tell the story. Uh, we were what? Oh, Laura's telling the story that I call in. Yeah. Uh, there was a, a caller called into the radio program and said, I was on, I was on my, the back, the back half of my round of golf. And as I was approaching the fairway, a black helicopter came and landed. They got out of the helicopter, went over and picked up my golf ball. And then went back in and flew off. So I turned on my <laughs> microphone and I said, wait a minute, is that a two-stroke penalty? And so that became, yeah, that, so that it became a papers. joke. But yeah, it made, yeah. it made it into the, the papers when I said that. But anyway. Yeah. Uh, just, the update, Paul. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, is there some sort of etiquette, right? Uh, I mean, and, and also the encounters another... versus sightings. Mm -hmm. So this little girl in Zimbabwe had That's an encounter point. She's come face to face and, and exchanged uh, communication. She must have said no. Um, 
Do you want to ride? No. Um, versus the siding. What is the proportion of the two that you hear in your hotline in incoming reports? Well, I get a lot of reports of alleged interaction with aliens. They usually occur in people's bedrooms. I don't know what to make of them. No. Uh, uh, I need proof. I'm trained as a scientist. And I asked them whether they got a photograph or did they, if they were aboard a spaceship, did they steal an ashtray or a, a towel, a monogram towel? They put their handprint on the wall. Yeah. yeah. Did you test for fingerprints? Yeah. So yeah. I'm sure I missed some legitimate reports, but uh, people have to convince me. I was born in Missouri, for example, the show me state, and they've got to prove to me that what happened, what they claim happened, actually happened. There are a lot of people out there who engage in confabulation, I observe. You got to be very- But that happens in any field as well. Yeah. So might attract- Politics, academia, everywhere. You're right, Laura. That's just human nature. But what happened with the little girl in Zimbabwe? That was just an eyewitness report. What proof was there well, of the, that? The whole school saw the object. Uh -huh. It wasn't just one young girl. It was dozens of students. And Dr. John Mack did a marvelous job of going over there and interviewing most of the kids and getting it recorded and documented. I've watched a number of yeah. tapes of his interviewing these kids, and I'm convinced that something very unusual took place there. What did the rest of the kids see that the little girl... Um the beyond what the little girl saw? I don't know the young girl's story very well. There were so many students interviewed in the film I saw that I'm not clear on which one you're talking about. Yeah, but... you're Zimbabwe. Um, so what do, you, what do you think is happening? Are these hostile forces? Are they benevolent? Uh, they haven't taken over the planet yet. So what do you, what is the purpose? What are we animals in a zoo to, to this phenomenon? What, is, what do you think's going on? Because you've heard the most reports probably of anybody, right? Half a million calls, many of which you've sifted out. Of those, you said 158,000 you consider noteworthy? Written reports, written reports. Oh, yes. written reports, okay. So, I don't know. I'm not sure I know anything more about the UFO field today than I knew 29 years ago when I took over the hotline. Uh, I don't know what their mission is, what their intention is. I have no idea whether we're at risk or not. But the only thing I can say is the government must know about this. If I can collect 158,000 UFO reports with nothing more on my table than a tape recorder, a computer, and a telephone. God only knows what the government has. With a lot more resources than you have and what they've been collecting. Yep. Yeah. So, so you know, I was talking with um, Paul Devereaux, who is an English researcher of ancient sites and uh, that phenomenon happening around ancient sites. And he was talking to us about earth lights. And I would have to say that my own UFO sighting would could be in the category of an earth light. It was just a ball of light that came out of the woods and uh, backlit our house as I was uh, approaching. But it was interesting because two friends of mine um, who I'd just been meeting with also saw something at the same vicinity at the same time, but theirs looked like hardware. Theirs looked like a ship, whereas mine mm. just looked like a ball of light. And um, so he was saying and recounting through history, through accounts from the Middle Ages and beyond, how many interesting phenomenon that might we might today say, oh, UFO, mm -hmm. it flew, um, it was in the sky, it moved around. Um, but, you know, among ancient stones, still flying. So his proposal is that this phenomenon has been with us for a lot longer than just our modern era. What do you think of that suggestion? I tend to agree with that assessment. Uh, if we can believe that 
cave paintings are prompted by UFOs, then uh, they've been with us for certainly hundreds of years and maybe more like thousands of years. I wouldn't put cave paintings and UFOs in the same boat, but some just do. written. Some do. I'm just I mean, saying I wouldn't. But, I know. Um, yeah, <laughs> but just yeah. some accounts and yeah. uh, and and documentations. So it's that whole category of experiences that people say could possibly be an alternate reality kind of experience popping in, and that you know things that we attribute to it being a a uh, extraterrestrial could quite possibly be other dimensional stuff within. Our, our own world. Right? Well, and, and also this. when you are in a society that is pre-mechanic me mechanistic, right? right. You, we haven't invented yet all the technology. Right. So we have to that explain we it have. Yeah. So what words and what terms and what framework and what worldview mm -hmm. are you considering this unusual phenomenon? Right. You all can only go with what you know, right? right? And perhaps we're attributing to quote hardware more than um because that's that's our era right where right. this phenomenon might be better described be in some other terms yeah. right yeah so yeah so it has to be a consideration that, because there is some this, evidence that, the of that as well and that's some of, yeah so the well you know going back to our our uh, conversations that we had with ipu priyara from the rainforest uh talked about that his people in their tradition oh, yeah, that's a good story you tell the story yeah Okay, well, Ipo Piara is a rainforest shaman who worked with the Smithsonian as an anthropologist. So he's yeah. well-versed in this world and his world. Put in both worlds. And uh, he was telling us that his tradition, his cultural tradition from the Urue Wawa tribe of uh, so, the rainforest of Brazil, mm -hmm. is that his people came down long ago in a clam shell that opened and outstepped his people onto the earth. So hmm. interesting. And he said that story. if you can really get the real stories, the cultural histories or the cultural mythologies, as we would call them, um, from many other tribal members, that they have similar stories. Mm. And mm -hmm. so this is not an eyewitness report. This is a culture. I mean, you can you can cage that in many contexts of such a yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. I suspect there are many stories like that. Exactly. It's our point. The issue is what evidence or proof do we have? Oh, yeah. and of course, none. Yeah. Until we have a time machine that allows us to go back yeah. that far and watch it with our own eyes, all we can do is flip a coin and say, is it true or not? Right. But, but there's, a charm, there's a charm mm -hmm. through the whole myth, mythopoetic understanding of of how their culture came together. And so that's, that is yeah. like that. There's many reasons why, right. for right. example, in ancient Egypt, you would say that the mm. gods go to this, the ancestors go to the stars, to the Milky Way, right? There's many reasons. And possibly we, in, in our community today, Fred Smith, who's a Vedic scholar, there probably is also stories in the traditions going back into the Vedas that could be interpreted that way as oh, well. That's Fred. Okay. In the meantime, continue because uh, Fred might be away from his computer. Oh, okay. So I will say that I have heard from a relative. Now, this is interesting. Do you wonder why maybe some people have sightings and other people don't? But I have mm -hmm. heard from a close family relative where long ago, he's telling me the story that he was in a plane and out the window, he's watching a UFO just kind of cruise along with the plane oh, to the point where even the pilot commented on it, how the pilot gets on yeah. and, and tells the passengers, oh, you may want to look out your left side of the plane. There's an unusual object here. And then they go on. This same relative had some unusual, I don't know what to call it, powers. He also talked about walking under street lamps. And as he walked under them, the street lamp would just go out and then go out and go, all right. And I, I joked with him. I said, you know, um, I can stand on one of those automatic door openings. I can jump mm -hmm. up and down on it and it will not move. It <laughs> will not open for me. It doesn't register me. I don't exist according to this door that's supposed to be an automatic open. Paul has seen this. I have yeah. this thing where I can be pushing on a computer button. I'll hear it click. It does nothing. I'm like, Paul. Paul comes within three feet of it. And all of a sudden, the computer will go, bing, 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 as though it's saying, hi, Paul, what can I do for you today? I have had that phenomenon. So I think there are certain people who my relative engaged technology 
that uh, in an unusual ways, it doesn't recognize me. I'm on the opposite end of that spectrum. So, well, it may be evidence of alien presence, but I couldn't certify that. <laughs> I'm just talking about how, you know, yeah. Yeah. sometimes we are detectors, we are receptors of unusual phenomenon. We human beings can be, some yeah, of us, exactly. or not. Yeah. So, Peter, now that you've spent really your adult life with this work to the depth that you have and you've devoted your life purpose to this, how do you see the legacy of this being carried forward? And do you have do you have some young people that are taking on the mantle that want to step into the UFO uh, Center network and they, oh, want, yeah. they want to be a part of it? And they say, you know, let us volunteer and take some of this on. Yeah. Good question. And I wish I could say yes. I wish I could say yes. There are people lined up ready to take it. Uh, my webmaster has volunteered to take on the man, take the mantle away from me. And I'm working on selling it to uh, any of a number of people. But you're right, Paul. I, I've got to, I've got to make some difficult decisions and walk away from this and leave it up to somebody else. I, uh, my predecessor, Bob Gribble, who founded the hotline in 1974, wow. uh, stepped away from it after having run it for 20 years and he was exhausted. I've done it for 29. I may be one of the few people on this planet who can understand how fed up he was with it. Hmm. What we need is a hotline that has a facility, a budget, and a staff to right. take the bulk of the work off my shoulders. And I haven't done that yet. But I but would... You're open sourcing your data, right? You're yeah. really sharing it with the world, yeah. right? Yeah. So I wonder if the government, you said, what's Eros? What's, wh who's starting a hotline? What are they going to do with that data? And are they going to be as generous in sharing it uh, yeah, just, as you have been? Good question. Just last week, Arrow announced that it had 202 new reports. They didn't say over what time period. Was that a day's worth, a week's worth, or a month's worth of reports? Right. For example, at the time of their sighting, I was in the process of, with my webmaster, updating the the UFO Center hot, uh, database. Right website and we posted 909 new reports so mm -hmm. i'm unimpressed by 202 reports from arrow <laughs> i'm surprised they haven't contacted me to get a stream of reports yeah, yeah. what are you going to do with all these reports and these archives what? they're published but are they um backed up are they you know they're what? in a computer and in a file file cabinet yeah. Oh, uh, and now Will had an interesting comment. Well, I'll let you see it because I see it on your side of the screen. Will says, I'm interested in the ways we attribute intentionality to objects that we see moving in particular, quote, purposeful ways. The philosopher Daniel Dennett has a lot of interesting things to say about our human propensity to do so. Just mm. a thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not sure I see the question there. Well, it's not really a question. A it's a comment. comment. It's an insight. Yeah. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Could, it, could there, is there any, anybody, I'm sure this has been done, because your database would be a perfect database from which to pull such data. But in terms of the different types of, quote, ships, um, if we can assume that somebody invented all of these tech, tech things that we're seeing um, in the in the air, in the skies, Okay, I see the cigar shaped one. I see the lights one. I see the eight mile wide one. I see the fairy lights. I see the <laughs> array of lights. I see, sure. um, I saw a ball of light. Triangles, all sorts of. Crap. Right, yeah. Triangles are popular as well. I see a saucer. I see um, different colors, different sizes, different um, propulsion patterns or whatever. Yep. I yep. see one that goes into underwater. I see one that hides in the clouds. I see one. Um, da, da, da. Has anybody said, okay, of these different types of ships and their different kind of patterns or histories or where they're showing up, is it over a military base? Is it over the ocean? Is it the Antarctic? Is it a village in Zimbabwe? Where these go? Is there any patterns? 
could we surmise that there's different civilizations, different? I haven't well, addressed that question in any detail, but people have analyzed our data. Yes. Thank Two you. women in New England analyzed uh -huh. data and we're looking for patterns, but I'm fairly unimpressed with the analysis of our data because I know how unreliable many of the reports are. Until you've removed the sightings of Starlink satellites and yeah. Yeah. Uh, all sorts of meteorological phenomena, right. you really can't use the data for much reliable analysis. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jamie uh, has a hand up here, and then Tony also has a follow-up question. Hi, Jamie. Hello. I'm so pleased to be uh, here, part of this. Thank you for hosting and everyone, everything you've shared. Um, I wanted to mention Jacques Vallée and some of uh, what he talks about is how he discerns interesting sightings is by the number of um, uh, observers and over time right uh and credible observers so mm -hmm. one example is the uh there was a phenomenon that happened over quite a long period of time where the amazon river meets the ocean and there were uh, military observers again over months of time as well as the indigenous people and there was all kinds of phenomenon that were uh where there was some uh, material um aspects to it right there there was some um, mm -hmm. uh -huh. observe etc and they had a lot of data through radar and other kinds of um so i'll just mention that as an interesting phenomenon you were asking about some uh of the the more kind of credible ones and that that's how he discerns which ones to look at is um credible witnesses multiple credible witnesses over time and this is an example the phoenix one was a very good example of that because there were so many credible witnesses and it was over a long period of time and a lot of data was gathered around it even though it was just one night right yeah um, I, I mentioned the book Daimonic Realities, a field guide to the other world um, by Patrick Harper, who uh, is bringing in that we're, we're really talking about something that is in between realms, right? It is physical and yet is not completely physical. It is personal, very yeah. personal, and yet it has a transpersonal or a beyond personal, meta personal, you could, might say phenomena and i'm really interested that we're where we are culturally that this is happening at this time because i think of things like the jeb jane uh, the james webb telescope and how our idea of um our own universe is changing so rapidly just in the last year i think this yeah. is exciting and an interesting phenomenon of a paradigm type of shift as was seeing the earth from space having the astronauts report back and the institute of noetic science that that grew out of you know the like uh, Mitchell sighting yeah. or, or experience on the planet. Yeah. I'm very interested in frontier science and and how, how this edge of our of our knowledge and understanding. And Patrick Harper's really pointing to our materialistic bias, our our material world bias, our, our very limited way of perceiving these things. Yeah. I'm really interested in what what are we seeing about our limits of perceiving, conceiving, and communicating about phenomenon? And I'm really interested in the way these things are are on the edge of we can track them. We do have we we have some uh, uh and so in the demonic realities he talks about this and he's talking about lake monsters, black dogs, Virgin Mary sightings, crop circles. I mean, through time there's been so many of these phenomenon where there are. There's burn marks in the yard. There's paw prints where there are no wild uh, cats in England. Wh whatever. There's. I mean, it's really interesting in between. Realms. And I think it's fascinating that it's really opening up right now. It yeah. seems mm -hmm. relevant that at the timing, we're like, we're, 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 yes. we're shown. wait a minute, open up, open up, open up. So I'll end my comment here because you asked for it about my own experience. Sure. Yeah. I think because one of the things Patrick Harper talks about is how this is very much in the realm of the uh, the trickster, right? Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. And it will not be pinned down. It will, and yet it will continue to emerge. It will continue to to tease us, to show, to to entice us, right? And so this happened to me where so I've been long interested in uh, anomalous phenomena in general, consciousness, which dovetails into this study, right? Yes. 
noticed my own aversion. I used to live in the desert, great place for sightings. And I had had a, a sighting, but it was, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a massive sighting. And I had one chance. I was in the superstition mountains. I was with people. If ever we were going to see one, it was that night. And I noticed my aversion. Somebody said, if, if, if ever what there was a night to see something, it would be tonight. And this huge no came up in me. And it came up again when I was in Southern California a few years ago, where people were watching over the Air Force bases there. And everybody had were seeing things every night, all the time. Mm -hmm. And I started chatting with this young the, a, a man that was there. Uh, I said, lovely night. And he said, yes, and a lovely night to see, to observe UFOs. <laughs> you know? And again, this huge aversion in me came up. So I started to really look at it because I thought I... I was good with this phenomenon. And I realized, no, Jamie, you're not. Mm -hmm. what, why are you aversive to it? What, what do you think about it? So I started studying more recently in the last five years. Well, I started to notice things. I started to kind of feel like my openness to it was attracting and it was subtle. But I also, again, I felt like, no, I actually don't. My life is plenty exciting. I don't really <laughs> want it. I mean, I don't. So I put it out. I'm like, with all respect, Mm -hmm. And all interest and, and curiosity, mm -hmm. no, nothing direct. I don't want to have a direct experience. And within a week, my partner told me I had been gone and I came back home and she had forgotten it. It happened the day the night before. And she told me in the morning, oh my gosh, I forgot to tell you. My friend, my other dear friend, and I saw this phenomenon last last night on the way to the party was Oakland and it, they she described very definitely something that I had read about and watched some videos on YouTube about <laughs> and I thought she was kidding no 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 you're you're because it was the stuff that I talk about and she's not interested in seeing it she doesn't write she doesn't believe yeah. she had never had experience but she described perfectly what I've heard other people describe ah. okay Call the friend, call the friend. So I call, we call the friend and she says, oh my gosh, I completely forgot all about it. Yeah, we saw a low aerial plane. It was, it had no markings. It was gray, made no sound. It hovered. We stopped the car going to the party. We stopped the car and it was daylight because it was so low over the houses. We thought it might fall on the car. Hmm. So we stopped the car, changed direction. I said, well, were people around you looking? Did you... They say, well, we were just looking at it. We didn't look around. It was too, I mean, we were kind of scared. We were, right? And they. I thought it was so interesting that they both forgot about it, but they both reported individually the same exact thing. So we. I'm going to report it. I'm going to report it to Peter. I'm going to them. And I looked the next day, I I looked online. Was did anybody else, was there any report of any other sightings? Because it just seemed so amazing. And yeah. they both. Absolutely saw it. And the thing I want to mention about it is that it to me was a wink from this trickster realm that was like, yes, you're on the right track and we're going to honor your request that you not have a direct experience, but we're going to, we're going to, get, we're going to tell you, yeah, it's real. Something's happening and it's going to come through your two of your best friends, closest people. Right. And, uh, the interesting thing to me, the one last thing is that my my one friend, I talked to her more about it later. And she, again, or this was earlier. She had poo-pooed it. I was interested in this phenomenon. She was poo-pooing it. And then it happened to her. So there was just, again, there was this kind of like a, a joking kind of wink, like, oh, you're not interested in it? Well, let's see if we can get you get you interested. <laughs> <laughs> I just, love this story. Yeah. Yeah. We'd love to have that story in our database. If you know, I will, I'm going to see... Um, we're going to get together today, Peter, and I will have them write it down. And I know I wrote it down in my calendar, what, what the date was and stuff. So we will. Uh, I love the insight of the I trickster too. energy, the mm -hmm. trickster energy applied to UFO uh, um, experiences. Um, that explains a lot. I love that because it, it kind of like ties it together in, in an interesting way. Mm -hmm. Well, think about it. So many people have been trying to, as you say, yeah. pin it no, down. Yeah. It well, slips through your fingers. I, yeah, and I mean, was... I I agree that I think this phenomenon mm -hmm. is much broader than just UFOs. Certainly beyond just hardware the mechanical, chips. yeah. And it's been with us from time immemorial, right. and yeah. it has many different aspects in terms of its appearance, its 
Um, it's winks at us. It's right. tantalizing. It's telltale clues. I think part of that church thing maybe is that there's so much energy put into the idea that it's technology, that it's some hard goods that we're going to find. That's a limiting it, view. It's such yeah. a limiting view of this. If they have that kind of technology to be here in an undetected way, why would yeah. it, why would it be, you know, hunks of metal sitting on the ground? It could well, be why a- did my two friends who are very much into right. UFOs as hardware and alien ships see right. what they saw? As- and I, who more like, I'm more earth-based yeah. and earth phenomenon and yeah, yeah. the consciousness. Yeah. Right. I see a, a beautiful ball of light mm-hmm. that I would like to see. If I, if I given a choice, That's I go, yeah, I want the ball of wow. light, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. That I will accept. In Jamie? My, yeah. I'm really continuing to demand that we attend. Uh-huh. Pay attention. There, and there's more than you are realizing. There's more than you can realize and keep yeah. open 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 broaden your our perspectives and be willing to talk about it i think it's i really do appreciate peter your documenting these personal cases because it it influences our lives right it is a very yeah. one that affects how we conceive perceive and communicate about the world and this is the important piece i think yeah. we're to help change our paradigm we are our, our time is changing right and it's we're it's helping us communicate about it and get more brave about yeah, no, this is some this is a real phenomenon. We don't understand it. It's not necessarily understandable to to the extent we would like to, right? But something is happening. Let's keep exploring. Yeah. I feel yeah. like how articulate you are on that. And I will say that I believe that yeah. um expanding our worldview is such a sacred task. Mm. And we have gone the route of looking at ancient techniques to open up that bandwidth in a beautiful uh celestial divine human way and i think that's what our work is all about but that is makes life exciting that Mm -hmm. puts us on the adventure the grand adventure yeah and we realize that humankind has been at this quest from day one and we're just the latest little chapter of of a very long story thank you for that yeah thank you really appreciate you and the sensitivity within our own uh, unknown sensitivity we were watching a documentary film was it yesterday was it on lions where they said they have to wear they have to wear uh, oh to suits. study lions and get up close to them without being detected so they can observe their natural behavior yeah they set up a hey lion uh-huh. come look what we put out for you but they were putting electromagnetic barrier suits because the lions can pick toe. up the electromagnetics right and like the major predators apex certainly sharks do that they can detect the bioelectrical signal so right. a fish under right. the sand yeah you're not hidden um, I we, said that about lions. Right. I'd have so, to inv- really look that up. So this is technology so, that we know about. It's been, you know, we, yeah. as humans, we put that stuff in the category of woo-woo, like it's some far out thing, but it, we see it in nature around us. It we exists. perceive this. Yeah. We have the receptor sides to do right, so. Right. And let's open them up further. And this is where it all ties back into the, the We are the part research. of that technology, Peter. That's our premise. But yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, in this institute that we represent, it comes back to that, that aspect of consciousness itself and that yeah. what the sensitivity. So it's not such a far off thing to be talking about ufos and be talking about um the direct experience and the level of consciousness that all of a sudden there's that it's a wide that, wide spectrum this far wide spectrum but let me i want to bring up i like that they're here but they're not here they're here but they're in between realms so much is yeah. between the realms yeah. and we and pre- oh, spread. Yeah, yeah previously we were talking about the fact that yeah, that there's documentation throughout history of these different types of things we talked about the story of the the tribe in brazil but i wanted to get fred in because fred we what we question we had for you was being a vedic scholar a religious scholar of of southeast asia and all of that um the other stories back in the vedas or whatever that could be considered a ufo story a story certainly of stories of flying uh, ships and things other people yeah. have cited that. welcome fred good to see yeah. you Hello, fred. yeah hi there hi um yeah sorry <laughs> I, I, I kind of had to step out for a couple of minutes here so i might have missed this but my questions i have, to, I have two questions one is based you know pretty close to what paul was just saying here and you know how does um how have you managed the evidence of these hundred and fifty thousand? reports as far as cross-cultural um or classically based or you know non-contemporary uh possible accounts of ufos have you have you broken these down into into categories have you looked into seeing how how 
this could all be played out within one's own separate, completely different cultural context? That's one question. Good question. Yeah. I haven't had time second. to do all the analysis, Red. Yeah, uh, let me ask my second question because that's related to this. Okay. You can probably segue directly into it, which is, have you in your website or elsewhere broken down these 150,000 reports into categories, you know, believability, unbelievability, you know, like acid trip, you know, <laughs> cavity, um, you know, how have you, I mean, can we access like your different categories through anything you've written or your website? We've introduced that capability to our website only just recently within the last several months. Ah. But I'm not sure I'm qualified to tell another person what he saw. Yeah. Call up and say, what did I see, Peter? You're the expert. And I I shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know. We count on you, the witness, to tell us what you saw. Right. Mm -hmm. I I hesitate to ascribe explanations to it, Fred, because I just don't know in most cases what they saw. If it's a sighting of an overflight of Starlink satellites, I can tell them what that is. Okay. If it's a solar or lunar eclipse that they're reporting, I know what that is. But in most cases, I cannot tell what the person is reporting. I don't know the source of it. So what yeah. we're left with then is a jumble of phenomena without any kind of classifications uh, or well, that sounds or anything? Classified by date and time and type of object seen. Was it a triangle? Was it an oblate spheroid or a prolate spheroid? There are mm -hmm. a lot of categories we do use, but trying to trying to come up with a an explanation for some of these reports is very difficult. It's and mm -hmm. some of them people talk about personal contact and probing and all this other types of stuff, and then there's other it's just the phenomena of 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 unidentified phenomena that cannot be dismissed based on what we know, what technology we have today, that there's something yeah. beyond what technology we have today. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, yeah. And so back to Fred's original question as well. But so I'm, the, cult culturally, there's an impact. I mean, the difference between someone observing um, something in China versus someone in Australia. Or look at someone... indigenous cultures. Oh, yeah, we know them. No yeah, problem. Right. Right. We've heard that response, too. In order to do what Fred is asking, have we done cross-cultural analysis? Right. We have because oftentimes I have no idea what the cultural background of the caller might be. Oh, I see. That would be yeah. a good question on the database. You might be yeah. had that, yeah. Do you yeah. believe in UFOs? You know, what do you not? What is your level of skepticism? And we that assume would be an interesting data. And we assume almost all of your reports are from US based, maybe Canadian and US, North American based. Europe. Uh, report. I would say ninety percent are. Yeah, you get a lot of reports from Asia and from Europe, yeah. from Russia, Africa, even. Yeah. So, yeah. but in order to do what Fred is asking, whether we've done this or not, we just don't have the time. I understand. Oh, uh, uh, the resources. The resources. Online, I use the royal we. <laughs> it, it is principally I who does the work. <laughs> we can relate put off my dining room table so well this could be an incredible database for somebody else to actually take up and exactly. and, and uh, you know use for a lot of other you know, right uh phenomenological they have actually oh they have yeah. yeah but the point i i make is in order for the results to be significant yeah. You have to eliminate the cases, the reports that are obvious hoaxes and so on. The distortion. Yeah. That takes a lot of work. You have to go through the database one case at a time, say, yes, this looks legitimate. This the next one does not. So you so basically... it would be interesting in terms of the, you know, the alien abductions or the or the uh, the reports that you're saying I, I have no proof, but even those could be analyze to see different people different times mm -hmm. what are they reporting or did they just get it from a book 
-hmm. right? Because there's this phenomenon that we've talked about also false memory phenomenon. And you can be led to believe something happened when it didn't just because you can, uh, your imagination can be activated. And so you'd have to screen for that as well. But, it's complicated, um, and I'm yeah, I, yeah. We're, we're I'm sympathetic the amount of work that we're talking about here. But it would be wonderful if the resources were available yeah. to take it down to that level. I mean, even mm-hmm. with our own work with the uh, the posture work, we see such a yeah. spectrum of experiences, and the, the amount of data that we collect is overwhelming for us to be able to break it down into categories constantly. Uh, and well, we, but it doesn't stop us from trying or trying, analyzing or wrong, discussing. Yeah. I think yeah. discussion is the fun part. And Fred, um, coming back to come, yeah. Fred, coming back to my original question to you personally and that is is that uh the the idea this concept of of ufos is that show up in the vedas does this show way back into history some kind of outside of oneself phenomena happening oh yeah <clears throat> yeah you, you definitely i mean there's a lot of different um contexts not just within india which is my field to, and uh, but you know there could be uh visions of phenomena from the skies that could be very based on on um astronomical uh sightings and so on because one thing we 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 know for absolute certainty is that in antiquity people lived a lot closer to nature Mm. and they knew the sky a lot better than we do now with the exception of tony yeah um (laughs) the uh uh, so what they were living with every day, 24 hours in their day, there was darkness. They could see stuff. They knew that what was abnormal and what was and what was not. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of records that sneak into all of these texts of unusual um, astral phenomena. Uh, but, you know, th- for us who live in cities, there's light, there's you know, I mean, in in my in my view, the 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 worst the worst culprit that's brought this this state of ignorance about us happened to be Thomas Edison, who turned on the first light bulb, yeah. and ended our night. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, but we, um, yeah, yeah. There's all of these texts are, are filled with such stuff. I I I don't know if anybody's done any kind of listing or categorization of of all of it, but certainly in India, there's a great deal of of data and i know that for certainly for ancient europe there is and we go back to indigenous, yeah. indigenous cultures and you find the same thing but um you know maybe somebody's done some research on this but i don't i don't know who's who's done it but I, i'm it's, if anybody it, knows t- let us know yeah. so we can invite yeah. them to get this this further yeah, yeah. discussed you would make a wonderful yeah. guest yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 well thank you fred appreciate your input yeah absolutely so and, uh, yeah, I will also Fazard oh, also has his, yeah has his hand up as well. Yeah. Fazard is an upcoming guest that we have coming up uh, the second or third week in November. Third week in November. Third week. Yeah. yeah, there you are. Hey man. Hey man. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! It's great to be here. This is a lot of fun. Um, yeah. Enjoying uh, uh, everything about the conversation. Um, yeah, I mean, whew, so much. I put some of it in chat. Um, Peter, thanks so much for <laughs> everything you've done yeah. for decades. For- thanks go to my hosts and hostess. They've done a wonderful job. Yeah. Oh, yes, thank you. exactly, exactly. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for making this all happen. I'm listening to this stuff and it's like, what do we do with this data? Oh my God, there's a needed team of people and all that stuff. And with machine learning stuff, I don't think you need a team of people anymore. You do need at least a team of one person who knows how to run these kind of questions through uh, machine learning uh, setup of whatever kind, if they have access to GPT-4, they yeah. don't even need the programming. But if you really want the fine scale analysis, then you have to do your own programming. Um, and I have a little bit of experience with this. I'm doing a history of alchemy kind of uh, a project, uh-huh. uh, help from people who do that stuff. Uh, and uh-huh. one of them is a, yeah, I mean, they this is what they do. They do the mathematics of of uh, machine learning, for example. So I got that guy talking to me, helping me trying to figure out how to ask questions of a database of literature 
that yeah. spans over 300 years and is like in different styles and different uh -huh. sizes and lengths and genres and all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, we can do it. We'll just cut it this way and that way and try to. So with your stuff, uh, I mean, you've got date, you've got place, you've got different kind mm -hmm. of patterns. So it's just kind of trawling through that uh, is not such a, it's, it's totally not just plausible. It's just like, you just need a, a couple of people to donate their time to do that. Uh, yeah. If we had funding, of course, that'd be even better. Then we can just like keep going and going. And, and you've you, the amount that you have certainly warrants that. It's like an interesting project on its own that yeah, would help sure is. improve the uh, software as well to improve the. the so maybe some volunteers will step up, Peter, and we'll give yeah. your uh, contact information here. Oh, it's a uh, towards the end. Yeah. yeah. No. So, but with a your... deserving body of knowledge and data, <laughs> and uh, just needs yeah, the resources to make it and uh, shake didn't... it out with some new answers and new questions. Didn't mean to cross talk. Sorry, uh, Fazad, what here you're bringing up here? I mean, this idea of machine learning. You're talking about AI. You're talking about what's happening mm -hmm. with the speed of how knowledge can now be. Now, that's the positive side of the scale that we're we 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 see happening and I, now that you've been exposed to it as a professor um and having it help you do your research and work uh are you stunned i mean what data it can bring up and what it can do which would which take you a life we're going to hear this report on alchemy that's here coming up weeks. in three weeks yeah yeah, yeah I, i'm stunned i am stunned i just uh i just uh, heard another talk from you know our education people putting together uh, technology education and you know where's it going all that. So heard a few other people got fired up again and thought, all right, I'll go back to my free version of chat GPT yeah. and play with that just to goof around, you know, last night. Yeah. And, uh, and that's the, the not powerful version um, and that it, it's going all over the internet until January, 2022. Then the next version of course is better, makes fewer errors. And it's like uh, contemporary with, you know, the internet today, wow. but what's better than both of those Anyway, I was impressed by the goofy stuff I did. But what what's better than having even ChatGPT4 is having your own uh, ChatGPT4 dedicated to your data. So it's not uh, mixing it with everything else out there, which is what it does. That's how it's mm -hmm. powerful. But uh, they're kind of working, I mean, lately with just like focusing in on, on one big data set and, uh, and just slicing and dicing through that thing. Yeah, don't so, add any more noise to the Yeah, picture. yeah, that's right. So it's anyway, it poses lots of interesting possibilities. It's pattern recognition. It's just old. It's what we used to call pattern recognition. You right. know, software, machinery, whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, it's just better at it, and it functions on language. And you can um, find things in there. It'll find things in there that you don't notice. Mm -hmm. you have just the more, the better you're fine tuning your question, the deeper it goes in there. So. That would be now that would cost something. <laughs> That's yeah. like, yeah, that, that would be like university kind of um, donating part of its time to that to that specific task. Oh, maybe Avi Love could get some funds. He's well funded. Yeah, yeah. But I hope Peter that you can manage this something like what Farzad is describing before you retire, because it's not just all on paper or on the computer. A lot of it's in your head as well. You need to be there to help ask the questions and and pose the the, the mission statements, uh, yeah. yeah statements here. Yeah. So I hope you can pull that off before. A good recommendation. Yeah. I wish I had time to do all these things that people recognize I should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. You needed more work. I, <sighs> I detected a little bit of like I'm <sighs> bored. I'm Peter. I'm sitting here on you know 30, 50 years of. Of information but i'm bored with so i don't <laughs> yeah no it's you're you can't take any more work but i think i'm going to try to just propose this for fun to uh to my university to see uh if they're uh, into having fun in this way and yeah, so, yeah. at least get the dedicated machine part for a, a little while and yeah. then just ask questions and bombs away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That some good fantastic. grad students who are yeah. looking for, you know, this is a personal interest. They've seen a UFO and they just can't wait to get at your database, Peter, to start uh, playing around with it. That we know you're a one man idea. show, what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like beautiful. For, uh, 
Farzad. Yeah. Suggestion, Farzad, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. 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 We'll stay in touch with Peter. Uh, I'm definitely interested in. Oh, good. I'll, Thank that'd you. That'd be fantastic. Okay. He's also yeah. trying to sell his um, uh, missile base. Yeah. That little, thousand that, square yeah. feet. Yeah. He's trying to sell it. So He's somebody's going to look at that and go, yeah, I need an underground town uh, bunker. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's a solid object. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> a solid object. Well, yeah, you know, coming perfect. back to your other point of like, it's great that people make these suggestions. It's always funny for Laura and I when someone comes, you know what you need to do? Oh, yeah. That's when they begin the sentence with, you know what you guys really should be doing? And we, and not, they're We've not volunteering, they're just giving us like, this is what you need to do. We've really learned to reply, that, what a wonderful That'd idea. Wonderful. When are you going to start in on that? When do you want to start on that? What can we yeah. do to support you? <laughs> yeah. Have you guys yeah. ever written an article about, no, but you could. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, Thank you. Well, oh Peter, this has been fun and fantastic. Are, are there more questions and comments? This is Any your last stories chance to that get, you on, get share? on with uh, Peter before we come to an end. But I, I do I have to have one quote that I sure, want to uh, share and get Peter's reaction. Okay. So, Peter, you've had this early UFO sighting. You actually investigated a UFO uh, case early on in your, in your yes. life. You've devoted this 29 years as a member of MUFON and uh, direct this center. So you've put in your 10,000 hours a uh, thousand times over. Yeah. So you're a PhD what, in, in, in ufology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. They should yeah. start awarding yeah. those. I so the I question I have is I'm sure you know Michael Stranick. Uh, yeah, he was I, another UFO uh, investigator, a favorite of mine, because he had this very astute insight that um, I've also witnessed as well, personally. He said that after many years of chasing down this phenomenon, he suddenly got very alarmed when the phenomenon seemed to have turned around and started to chase him. Yeah. And by that, he meant odd things would happen within his own home, his own office, his own work. And he would notice just weird things starting to happen in his own life. He said, it was fine when I had to talk to other people about the weird things in their lives, but I did not appreciate it when it started to happen in my own life. <laughs> Have you found something similar? No. And as I look around my house, I think things could be happening around me and I wouldn't notice them. <laughs> such disarray that uh, they could be taking place all day every day and I wouldn't know what was going on but I haven't experienced that I I lead a normal humdrum life answering the telephone yeah I haven't uh, experienced anything unusual I would say uh, you're anything but humdrum Peter yeah but, yeah well and uh, you're, yeah. you're a landline phone too you're doing the old-fashioned phones which most of us don't have anymore. Would you like yeah. to give out your phone number, by the way? Your yes. UFO hotline phone number? Yes. Uh, the hotline number has been the same for 49 years. It's area code 206-722-3000. That number again is 206-722-3000. If anybody experiences a UFO sighting, please call. The one thing I would ask, I'm getting a lot of calls of from people who've had sightings in the distant past decades ago. Yeah. I just don't have the time to listen to all these stories. So please go to the website, ufocenter.com, write them down and submit them in written form if you yeah, would. Yeah, of course. That makes much more sense. Draw pictures yeah, as yeah. if you can. Yeah. yeah. And Tony has a comment he wanted to jump back on for. Hi, Tony. Hi. Uh, well, absolutely astounding comments. And Peter, I'm really, really enjoying this, appreciating what you're bringing to it. Uh, just, just a little note. Um, um, the, the Webb telescope and the appreciation of the sky we have from that was mentioned. Well, guess what the next uh, great mission that's being planned now? It's called Habitable Worlds Observatory. <laughs> and it's, it's to look for habitable worlds around other suns. Yeah. And, and I'm uh, I'm involved in that. Sorry about the doggy, uh, but that's okay. Yeah, uh, but yes. Uh, so uh, anyway, this uh, this is what NASA is putting their money in. This is the next great one. The next. Uh, well, we have an intermediate one. Hold on. Habitable dog world. Sorry. Observatory. Uh, observatory. One of my jobs is to let the dogs in and out. Sounds like yeah. a big dog. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's a. Oh, there's just three of them. 
Yeah. Just the way, yes. Uh -huh. uh, so anyway, sorry about that. But uh, anyway, fascinating talk. Uh, just another quick question, uh, something I encountered at one point in my life when I used to run the campus observatory at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, oh. And Eric von Donegan came out with Chariots of the Gods. Yeah. And, th and this was something I had to talk about twice a week to uh, to popular crowds that would come to the observatory and were fascinated by that. Uh, has this helped or hurt uh, uh, from your point of view? Uh, I have my perspective on that, but I, I'm wondering what yours is. What has helped or hurt? I didn't understand. Uh, oh, the Char Chariots of the Gods by Eric oh. von Donegan. Well, all of this literature has an effect on the field and the more people who read more books, create more questions and more stories. Um, the one thing I would, one thing I'd like to emphasize to our audience is if you've ever seen a UFO at any time in your life, we're interested in it. Doesn't matter how many decades or years ago it was. We'd like you to write down what you can recall. And usually yeah. people will call UFO sightings very well. Write it down and submit a written report. Yeah. Most people want to want to talk about it, so they call the hotline. Mm -hmm. And I'm flattered by that, but there's very little I can do about a sighting that occurred 40 or 50 years ago. <laughs> but it's good to have it in the database. Yeah, 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 yeah. So as a written report. Well, it's also yeah. Yeah. Of course. So yeah. Tony, have you, you uh thank you for submitting yours too. Yeah, yeah. You'll be thank doing you. that. You mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, um, I would like to ask Peter about the book collection, and Tony. I know you're uh, you collect a lot of books as well. Maybe you have some suggestions. But you mentioned you have a vast book collection. What are some of the highlights that you would recommend on the phenomenon? A what collection? I didn't book, hear the books. Oh, yeah. Who's anything by Stan Friedman. There are a lot of excellent books. Even yeah, some that were published in the fifties and sixties are good. Yeah thought-provoking and i find i enjoy the older books as much as i do the new ones that are coming out mm -hmm. but one i would recommend is fire in the sky by travis walton it's a stunning account of an interaction between one person and a group of aliens i'm impressed by the travis walton case happened uh the 5th of November, 1975, down in your area, in Arizona. Yeah. That's one story I would recommend. Mm. Just for reading material, people couldn't do a better job than just go to the UFO Center website and start reading some of the reports. Right. I think most people will Just on the web, see, it's all over there and free. Yeah. 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 Quickly see the difference between legitimate reports and reports of dubious authenticity dubious i love that yeah <laughs> so well, thank you so what you can say. so i was just going to say that in terms of a worldview mm -hmm. i would say that most at least americans that i've run into europeans that i run into um and indigenous people that i've talked with had the privilege of talking with are are saying yeah aliens no problem yeah how could we possibly be alone in the world yeah. How could we be a fluke? I'd rather not be a fluke. That's scarier than to think that the universe is teeming with life, is yeah, it I not? Agree. So most of us are already on board with, yeah, no big deal. We're still here. So obviously it's not like our sci-fi movies like to, to project, you know, yeah. hey, they need our planet. They're going to push us aside. Um, so apparently we're- Could happen. <laughs> we're well integrated you know earth is a melting pot already right yeah yeah so um i think yeah. we're already there so you brought up the earlier question about wouldn't we wouldn't we change society it's probably going to change our technology if we're back engineering some propulsion system or hardware or material right. um technology so but aren't aren't we already there for the most part i uh, think Tony? we are I, peter i don't think Revelations about the UFO field is going to change the average person's life at all. I don't either. It certainly wouldn't change the life of a young person. If you looked at cartoons on the television recently, yeah, they're dominated by space themes, by alien themes, UFO themes. So I think the government probably is realizing this and they're slowly meeting out 
uh, information on the subject that will yeah. finally alert people to the fact that we're not alone. I suspect confirming we what we already know. Yeah, we live in a galaxy and a universe that is just teeming, not just with life, but with intelligent life, with civilizations. That's yeah. my suspicion, based on my work to date. But yeah. who knows? And, and Tony, what do the it. people at NASA think? Aren't they? Are I mean, are they? Well, well, they haven't contacted me. The, the killer <laughs> application of the century is going to be uh, habitable worlds observatory. Habitable yeah. this, this worlds. Is, this has been a theme since uh, before, just before 2000. And at one point, I was NASA's technologist for for the the predecessor of Terrestrial Planet Finder. Uh -huh. Yeah, there's a there's a great deal of interest and investment in this. This has been something that's been prepared for uh, already a quarter century, and and will be implemented in about 20 years. So 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 20 this years. Is the, wow. Well, it, it takes a while, and we learned lessons from Webb, where mistakes were made, which turned out to be very costly. And that was we did not adequately assess the technology readiness. Mm -hmm. This next observatory will be, in some people's estimates, mine included a hundred times harder to do than than others. Uh, I mean, the the object to see a pla habitable planet around a star is like having an observatory in Sedona, right. trying to look at a firefly next to a lighthouse in Baltimore. Yeah, it's about that, it's about that hard. Uh, no. the atmosphere, but it, but in terms of distance and uh, and resolution, it's it's a, it's a big challenge. Uh, but it's a huge thing. One question I have for Peter, and that is, uh, if they are coming to us, uh, maybe is this at all correlated to to how bright the Earth has become since the advent of Mr. Edison, as as Paul pointed out, right. since the advent of radio, since the advent of television. Yeah. And the idea that that every civilization has a period of brightness where where we emit to the universe, but that may be short. It may only be a couple hundred years, and then all of a sudden, all communication will be by optical fibers and 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 um, by subtle things like satellite communication, as opposed to antennas that blast hundreds of kilowatts in all directions and stuff. Um, wow. So I'm just wondering wondering if there's any thought of, of the attractors to Earth and and is there some way to characterize that? This is something we, we take into account in the in the whole concept of, of even looking for targets for uh, for for the uh, habitable worlds observatory to look at. Good question. And Stephen Hawkins, as you probably recall, addressed this issue. He said we may have made I'm paraphrasing now, but he said we may have made a mistake in inventing the radio because, as you correctly point out, Tony, we're broadcasting to the galaxy and the universe our presence. And we may not really uh, be happy with that in the final analysis, attracting yeah. sorts of interest. Well, yeah, we're, like we're the prey doesn't the... want to make a lot of noise on the savanna to attract the predator. Is that what you're implying? Or that, well, hey, a noisy well, planet, they must be new in their technology because it will become more sophisticated and energy efficient in future mm -hmm. if they keep it up. Is, that's your point, Tony. They wouldn't be broadcasting electromagnetic energy willy nilly in all directions. Well, and well, also well, drop me, into our content. If we're, invest, yeah. if we're going to invest in flight from one one solar system to another. That's mm -hmm. a big investment. You would not want to go to a place that appeared dark. You'd say, hey, there's signal here. There's something happening. Right. You make a good point. Life, and, let's go investigate. And light, and, and particularly in the RF regime, mm -hmm. uh, that's happening. It's modulating. It, there's intelligence. There's uh, there's linguistics. There are all sorts of things there. So uh, there, there is this thought that, that maybe uh, in addition to the telephone and the ability for Peter to collect things in this wonderful database, that there may be a specific reason why we're hearing more about this in the 20th century and the 21st century than we did in the 16th century, let's say. Well, yeah, let me think that, that, that Prasad has, a, has a, a point and I should get off now, but thank you very much once again. I think that well, may I be the want, best. That might be though. the best. That might be the best argument for dark sky community after all. <laughs> right. Good one. Yeah. But I want to say that Tony, with the Habitable Worlds Observatory, so is it NASA's 
mission to find where we might become the aliens to foreign to other planets, right? We would be that phenomenon to come and arrive. Hey, let's terraform this planet now he's here. Um, and shove off whatever life might be there, maybe in other dimensions. Yeah. I mean, we're going to become the very phenomenon we're frightened of. Do you, I mean, think about that. We'd be coming full circle, right? Oh, and we're yeah. changing roles we're the, here. We're the aliens. Now, uh, the, now we're the foreigners arriving. Hey, we're here. We'll send we're Jeff Bezos over. first. Oh, sorry. oh, good one. Good one. Yeah. Laura, you mentioned the dirty word, terraform. Mm -hmm. If you mention that around NASA, people will go, ah, uh, there's great, there's great, um, there are great issues about planetary protection. And even when we go, when we go to the moon, when we go to Mars, et cetera, you have to take great precautions. And we have yeah. the prime directive then. Okay. We've learned from Star Trek. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so th there, that's clearly, uh, that's clearly not, not, not the aim of what's happening. The question is, is really first, what is there? We can oh, look, we're going to be looking at at about a hundred targets, target stars. It will take a long time to do each. It will take months. We're going to be looking at about a hundred target stars that have a probability of having an Earth-like planet around them. And mm -hmm. we'll be looking in in a means different than the other methods we use, looking for exoplanets. And each of these methods has observational selection. And, and the observational selection does not favor finding exo-Earths. This new mission, Habitable Worlds Observatory, this was the directive of the National Academy in the Decadal Survey. Uh, and uh, this is um, a worldwide importance and we'll have worldwide engagement in this. Mm. It's, a, it's a big deal. And, so this uh, would be, let's go see where the aliens might be living or life as we life recognize it that, yeah. might be living and let's go extend the calling card first. We'll knock on their door rather than just wait for them to knock on our door is basically well, what you're saying. Well, it, yeah. it's it's first of all to find out if other planets offer conditions that could be- The conditions. To, yeah. to, right. to, to, to life similar to our own. And right. then if there is, I can only imagine what will happen next, but that's yeah. uh, that, that's another well, story. Well, we'd be sending the AI um, operated probes Long distances, it might be the exact thing that Avi Loeb suggested Umuamua was, right? Oh, yeah. Because if we can reverse roles, then any alien civilization with the technology perhaps more advanced than ours would be sending a probe first to check us out. Yeah. That's what he suggested flew by, right? Yeah. As a this yeah. weird object. That's right. I mean, it's just not out of the realm of conceivability. It's how we would behave. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm just saying... We're, at some point, we're going to be sitting down with all these aliens and talking shop, right? This is this is how we, you know, we are because we're going to be there ourselves. This is the trajectory that we're on. Okay. okay. How can we fault them for it? Yeah. We just Boy, hope that. I, I, yeah. Well, we have the picture of sitting around the table with little green men and other <laughs> others. Exactly, creatures. just like out of a sci-fi yeah, movie. You and Laura and Paul. And, yeah, no, I, I wouldn't <laughs> be at that meeting. Yeah, Peter wants to be at the meeting too. Yeah, 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 sign indeed. me up for that dinner engagement. Yeah, bring, bring your own talking oh, stick. Fun. Yeah. Well, yeah, I have well, to say that this is one of the most important questions yeah. that we've been asking for time uh, immemorial. Are we alone? Right. I hope not. I hope that the whole universe is a womb of creation. Well, That's how I picture it. And well, so well, here we are. Yeah. Let me Let's make minute. friends with everybody. Go ahead, Tony. But the National Academy of Science agrees, and I should get off because uh, first of all, that's an, another important point. But thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you so much, Tony. <laughs> Thanks, Keep Tony. Up the good yeah. work. Yeah, and Azad, you are our final commenter today. Okay. All right, yeah. There you are. Okay, thanks. I don't want to take up any more time. It's already done. No, you're but fine. I was just going to say the uh, physical, the impracticality of sending physical objects long distances, you know, at sublight speed is just annoyingly. Uh, insurpassable in my opinion for now yeah. but on the other hand sending signals at light speed to play with the perceptual pr propensities of people that's a lot easier I can that's very plausible that you could send signals or basically mess with people's heads uh, yeah. and these things are already you know that's true yeah. well that's a good one yeah. yeah, and then all the phenomenology would be the same you would have all these reports that are authentic perceptual Mm -hmm. uh, occurrences that people have had experiences, uh, but it could be projected 
and playing on our uh, psyches or uh, our our percent the whole thing because we're receivers and transmitters so if you figure out the fine details of transmission and, and reception right. of this thing it's it's then you know at light speed you can just send it all over the place and that's what would happen first if you want to go like that and then mm -hmm. you know if it's even necessary to or even possible to send physical objects yeah. and, you know, at good, good point. Speed. And then yeah. there's the multidimensionality thing, which I I don't love that, but you know I guess it's possible. <laughs> it's there. You yeah. gotta open up the realm of consciousness, and now we have a lot more um, possibilities. Well, who knew when we started today's yeah. topic, it would we didn't intend it to become a think. Oh, you tank knew we'll end up in consciousness. Yeah, you know is a, that. This That's is the UFO think term. tank. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. my gosh! <laughs> and another project for us here at the institute. We love thank this. you so much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. But Fasa. I will say that, um, given Farzad's point, Peter. When you see a phenomenon that has been so well documented that you've described, like the Phoenix Lights, right. where you may have an object, if it wasn't projected in consciousness, um, but if it was there physically mm -hmm. in this reality that was eight miles wide, you know that they have technological capacities beyond. Of course, yeah. Well, we could even imagine. Really? Think about our cave ancestors, cave dwelling ancestors. Think looking at our technology today it would be inconceivable. Mm -hmm. It would look like magic. It would look like that. Just yeah. So I I can imagine that we would go beyond our current limits. Mm. I can imagine that other that it's possible to go beyond our current limits. Sure. Who are we to say we're the epitome of technological advancement or consciousness or anything? Right. We're obviously we're somewhere in the early infancy. Yeah. Um. In terms of the whole universe and its fourteen billion years of possibilities and growth yeah. so you yeah. know that that doesn't phase me um i don't know how i just can imagine who knows we're not at the apex mm -hmm. so peter final thoughts yeah final thoughts peter and thank you for today it's been fun well thank, thank you, you. i'm i'm flattered by the invitation it's been really a trip through nostalgia lane being with the two of you as we did 30 <laughs> years ago exactly thank you but yeah. It's been a lot of fun, and maybe we can do it again sometime. Yes. Yeah. I just, it I looks just, to me as though we're being visited routinely yeah. by things we call yeah. UFOs. I refuse to adopt the new term of UAP. Yeah. Yeah. I it would tell you. looks to me as though we're being visited routinely. Yeah. I went to one last story because I think that what I'm feeling about all of this revelation by our government must be what you're feeling as well. And I will say that. You know, I was a pretty daring talk show host. I booked my own guests and the UFOs kept coming up, kept coming up, especially when I admitted I saw one. Then there were the floodgates. I had to tell my story and then the floodgates, right? And people calling in their stories all the time. And so one, you know, I'm like, I don't know. Um, in our building, I was at King Radio at the time. Okay. Owned by the Fisher family. They in had a TV Seattle, station Washington. as well Seattle, in Seattle. And uh, in our building was Bill Nye, the science guy. Oh, yeah. He was doing a, a show, some yeah, sort yeah. of comedy show at that time or whatever. That. And so he pinned me down in the hallway once. He goes, da 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 Occam's razor, da 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 I go, I don't know. I, just, I, saw, I saw what I saw. I can't say what it is. I get calls. It's fun. It's interesting. People yeah. are, you know, these. So I go, why don't you do a debate? So I invited Bill Nye, the science guy. I, don't debate me, Excellent. debate, um, who was that? I can't remember who we had, our audience, Bill. And uh, so we had the debate and guess who won in terms of the consensus, in terms of the consensus of everybody, because we had a vote. Yeah. Of course, UFO as a legitimate phenomenon to question and to report on, and who knows what, you can't say it is, you can't say it isn't. Bill, you you know, Occam's razor aside, you can't slam it down yeah. and say that categorically couldn't exist. So I just want to call up Bill Nye, the science guy, and I just want to go, debate, Bill. <laughs> He's pretty and I guess how adamant you were that this couldn't possibly <laughs> exist. Look what the government's saying. Yeah, he gave it a He did, he did. He was gracious at the end, I yeah, have yeah. to say. Hasn't but talked to us once, since. No. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, 30 <laughs> years later, the government is coming clean, it appears. Yeah, There's, right. That's it, Peter. You're right. Certainly have added a, a layer of legitimacy to the UFO field that wasn't there before. So I'd like to meet Bill Nye. I'd like to debate him. Yeah, <laughs> me too. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder what his position is now. But since then, he's gone very green. 
you know, very much of ecological. So He's gone to Hollywood him. too. So yes, yeah. anyway. good for him. All right, so, everybody. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much to be here. First of this all, thank really you, Peter. And fast. This thank is you. a blast. A blast. I'm indebted to the two of you. Yeah. Well, You've been a long time friend, fun. Peter, and it's just good to yeah. um, good. see you keeping on. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye, Peter. Good health. Bye-bye.